Well, let's let's I guess. That was easy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> let's get that in there. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, as Nathan said, I'm Michael Goff, principal for NCC Group, founder of Market Malware Archaeology and IMF Security. And we're here to talk about uh, everybody needing a process to check your running processes and modules. The bad guys and red teams are coming after them. I am a blue team defender ninja, malware archaeologist, logaholic. And this is normally where I do my hello, I'm a logaholic. Everybody says, hello, Michael, but we're virtual. So I'll just imagine you all saying that. And I'm a principal incident response engineer for NCC Group. And I love properly configured logs because they tell us who, what, where, when, and hopefully how. I'm the creator of all these cheat sheets and also LogMD. Many of you have heard me speak at this conference before and others. And I'm also co-host of the Incident Response Podcast, uh, recently renamed from the BDIR podcast, Breaking uh, Down Security went nonprofit, and so we had to change the name. But it's the same bat channel, same bat time, which is basically whenever you want to listen to it. So take a listen. So why this talk? To find the bad. Yep, the bad. And of course, this is Jar Jar Jimmy the James, and uh, we all know him well. Hopefully he's listening uh, here, so, you know, all this doesn't go for naught. File us in memory only malware. To address this expanding threat that is becoming more and more common, too common. Whoops. Commodity malware, red team engagements, and of course, APT attackers use it. This method can avoid many security tools as we have found being uh, IR folks and dealing with uh, red teams. So it's uh, becoming quite a, a challenge for us on the on blue side. So we're here gonna tell you how to deal with it. So first let's rethink or redefine fileless malware, the so-called invisible malware. Rethinking fileless malware. So fileless malware that can only be found in memory of a running system is malware plus memory. So let's call it memware. And now I think many of you, when you hear the term memware, you can kind of immediately conclude, ah, it's malware running in memory. And that's the idea here, right? To try to help us understand where to hunt and or do our incident triage for the so-called fileless invisible malware. No files can be found if you scan the disk while the system is running, right? That's a typical example of memware. Or it's very short-lived, just long enough to load, right? Drop the payload, execute the payload, delete the payload, which will also bypass a file integrity monitoring solution. Um, so this is that typical uh, uh, memory or memware uh, malware. Typical infection vectors are uh, injection, so I can inject into a running process. I can deal all side load, hijack, like we see with Drydex. I can process hollow, or I can take a chunk of code out and put a chunk of code in. I can download source code and compile it on the fly, .NET, JSC, whatever. And of course, the user can always just double click it, causing one of the above to occur. Fileless, as you know, quote unquote, malware, uh, the file lives somewhere. So let's do a better job guiding people where to look for signs of it. So regware. This is malware plus payload in the registry we'll call regware. So now if I say regware, I know to go look in the registry for some signs of scripts or payloads. If I say WMIware, same thing. WMI is a database, registry is a database. So it's malware plus the WMI database, thus WMIware. So now if I tell you WMIware, you'll think either look A, look at WMI commands and or look in the WMI database. PowerShellware, and this is just malware plus PowerShell. So PowerShellware, this is where they will utilize script, PowerShell script to do all the foo. Uh, this is PowerSploit, things like that. And uh, where they store it could be the above items or download it on the fly and run on the fly. And then there's compileware. This is the typical, again, malware plus payload compile on the fly, CSC, uh, uh, things like that, that will compile the malware and detonate uh, from on the box. So that way there's no uh, signatures because every piece of in compiled where will be different. And then of course, download where this is where literally a trusted binary, like you also call this lull bass where lull bin where, where it will go to the internet, pull the payload down and execute it. Right. And it's constantly doing that as part of the infection process. So there's no file on disk at any given time. That's going to be uh, obvious to detect. Keep in mind, not all malware will have an auto run or ASEPT or a uh, auto run forest run uh, or ASEPT or persistence. The latest trick bot, for example, on domain controllers. So they're infecting a client's workstation and then they're using the SMB flaw or the SMB opening to inject 
their payload to a domain controller, which is where all your credentials live. So it's a great place to, uh, to live and being a memware type solution. So that way, if I go do an IR and triage and I go scan the disk for typical locations, see users, whatever, uh, I'm not going to see it, right? I'm going to have to rely on other mechanisms. How did they get it there? Maybe look at lateral movement or scan the running processes and their modules. Especially the red team doesn't like to leave IOCs. So they're going to do stuff like injecting in the uh, memory or DLL side loading, right? They'll definitely want to utilize this capability. And then uh, again, on like Drydex does on the shutdown of the box, they can write an auto run to disk. And then when it starts up, delete the auto run. So that way there's no detection uh, of it during the system's live running. So that's kind of an important point. Drydex used to use this a lot. The latest Drydex I evaluated from July did not do this. Uh, maybe they decided that they don't have to because, uh, uh, you know, nobody's catching their stuff anyway. Um, and of course, so what in memory may be all we can see. That's an important point. So we're starting to see more and more malware where the only signs of it existing are in memory. They've done a good job of making sure it doesn't live on disk. They've used various uh, techniques to get it into memory without it living on disk. There may be signs of, of stuff in the logs, but we'll, we'll talk about that. And again, like I mentioned in the latest TrickBot, um, the domain controller does not have any remnants and does not survive a reboot. So there isn't going to be an ASAP. There isn't going to be any files on disk. We literally have what's in memory only to detect this attack. So how do we find this stuff? Well, uh, first things first, we must map everything to MITRE attack. This is kind of crucial. I think as, as pr security practitioners, as we build uh, log queries and log alerts as we use our EDRs, um, whatever tools, LogMD, whatever, we need to make sure that whatever we're looking for, whatever we're alerting on, that we map this to something that allows us to start coloring in the total picture of, of what attacks us. In this case, there's three examples here, T1500, 1127, 1055, three examples, four, and 1196. Uh, compile after delivery, so this is that, that compile on the fly. Trusted developer utilities, this is the low bin stuff. Process injection, this is where I'm gonna inject into Explorer, for example. And then the infamous control panel items, the control panel applets, which I'm gonna talk about later. And then of course, of course, sub techniques are coming. Well, guess what? Two weeks ago, uh, they came, and so they're now out. Which, whoops, boink, boink. Which now leads us to a couple more ways of looking at this area. So now, with a T1574, a hijack execution flow, there are 11 sub techniques. So now, if we want to look at hijack execution flow, and we want to cover the entire gamut of it. Well, you've got 11 sub techniques you have to deal with. Just one of them being DLL side loading, which is 1574.002. So everything under the sub techniques is going to be .001 through dot whatever. They're not necessarily in numeric order as well because it depends on the OS they're they're addressing. So DLL side loading is what Drydex uses. They use a low bin, they put it in an odd directory, usually under the user directory, sometimes under the Windows System32 directory. They then put their bad DLL next to it when they call that well, that, that known trusted Microsoft binary, it does the hierarchy load and says, ah, the DLL needs it right here. And it loads it, thus side loading the bad DLL. And so now if you're gonna go out hunting or you wanna detect for this condition, you're gonna have to scan for these DLLs in memory because for the most part, you're not gonna notice the little bin part of it loading because it's, you know, again, a typical trusted Microsoft binary, uh, but there'll be this weird DLL running and you'll have to detect that. So once you do, you can then highlight 1574.002. We can detect that, we're good, uh, moving on. And I'm, I'm now starting to map what I do. And then there's process injection, right? 11 more sub techniques, one of which is portable execution injection. Uh, .02 as well, that again, if I'm looking for an injection into Explorer and I can detect this condition, I can then highlight that in my big matrix, which if you take my training, I say, go plot 36 by 48 of the attack matrix and laminate it and start highlighting it with colors so you can kind of see where you're at. So we need a process, and I say process because I'm uh, giving kudos to my, uh, in the upper right-hand corner there, to my friend, uh, colleague here, Andrew Hay. Uh, I always give him a bust his chops. So we're using the Canadian version of process so we can separate the process you need to create from running processes. I'm not going to say process, process, because what am I talking about? So process is the, is the logical flow of things you're going to do. Process is what's running in memory. 
So thank you, Andrew, for uh, reminding me of the Canadian version of uh, process. These tools, uh, again, aren't just preventing the technique, right? Our, our security tools just aren't preventing it enough. Uh, I worked with a large EDR, and they consistently got by, the red team got by with uh, CPL attacks, which was really a drag because it's a consistent problem we had over and over again because the EDR just did not do a good job of this low bin loading a, a side loading or, or just calling a, a bad DLL, and how they got that DLL was downloading it on the fly um, or storing it on disk. We need to build a process into our hourly, daily, weekly, monthly routines to detect and alert for this technique. Now, whether you're hunting, um, it doesn't matter whether you're detecting, you know, whether you're through your SIM, your EDR, whatever solution you want to use, log and D. Uh, but we need to do something here. We, we've got to start looking at this area. And of course, we need to build a process for our daily, weekly, monthly, yearly routines to threat hunt. So as you start building threat hunt capabilities, can I go out in my environment and look for signs of DLL side load in the Hydridex? Can I go out and look for signs of injection into Explorer? Things like that. So there are basically two different ways you can do this. One, dump memory. This is the traditional forensic scenario. Uh, and analyze that memory dump. So once I dump it, take the time to go through that dump. And then I can use a tool like volatility or, or other memory forensics tools and all the plugins to then determine what the image is, right? Go through all that process. Or go ahead and check running processes and their modules for signs of the additional DLL, in this case, uh, uh, Drydex and additional DLL or other malware or injected code into say Explorer. You can use a tool like LogMD Premium. It says Promium. That, that's a typo, so scratch that. It's Premium. Must be uh, tied back to the process there with the Andrew. To scan a live system for modifications to running processes and their modules. So the idea here is I can scan a system live go system to system to system, looking for that condition, or run this as a task, scheduled task, uh, and, and collect this information as an example. So finding memware. Traditional forensics has us dumping a memory image and running tools like volatility against it, right? It takes time, you gotta go run all these memory dumps, you gotta collect all these memory dumps, you gotta store all these memory dumps. Logs can contain a lot of details that can alert you to this behavior if you collect then detect or hunt on them. So the case of the low bins or the CPL control panel applets, you'll see these executions. And if you're collecting process command line, which please collect process command line, will give you the details you need to potentially see that something might be occurring here, uh, especially if they're doing more uh, oddball behaviors after they infect the machine. So checking running processes and their module on a live system is a great option. Better yet, look for signs of injection. Look for other artifacts, auto runs, ASEPs, registry keys, storing scripts or payload, right? This is the, the RegWare, WMI databases, storing scripts or payload. This is WMIWare. And of course, odd PowerShell, uh, large blocks, obfuscation, PowerShellWare. You know, look for those signs as well, because sometimes that's where these things will originate, depending on the attacker or the, the group that's doing it. Signs of injection. So what does this look like? A running process shows signs of additional or replaced code. That's what it looks like, but what does it actually look like? We're gonna talk about that. This condition is detectable by a few tools and an obvious indicator of bad. That doesn't mean you're gonna have, not gonna have false positives. You will have false positives because there are things like Firefox and Chrome and system utilities, your disk utilities that will do odd kind of behaviors because of what they're doing on the box that potentially will either inject or implant code or have a lot of hooks as in the case of the browsers. And yes, you know, some system drivers will show up here too. So you will have to do some baselining to, to filter out the known good. An example of LogMD Premium. So if you launch LogMD Premium and do a minus proc, a minus MD, a proc is running processes and modules, minus MD is the exclusion of known good processes unless there's a sign of injection. So if, for example, Explorer was injected, but of course, explorer.exe on disk is in the master digest, so I'm gonna throw that out. If I did that, then you wouldn't see that Explorer is injected. So if there's signs of injection, the master digest is not applied to that scenario. And then the minus I lists the process of signs of injections. Uh, our B9 module will list the, do some static evaluation of that process 
uh, ex exported file, if we dump the file that's in memory or we extract it using volatility, we can do a static evaluation of that, of that file and also the strings and, and look for indications of, of bad there. And of course, we can also do a VT lookup, but again, it's gonna look at the hash, which means it's gonna go to the disk and look up Explorer and it's gonna come back as clean even though it's injected. Um, but we can also do that with known bad DLLs that are dumped and look at its hash and send it to VirusTotal and or the file to VirusTotal and look at that. And of course, the minus X will dump the files required to look at the injected code or the siloed DLLs. An example of B9 module static file analysis, you get things like, you know, again, the name of the file, bad.exe, the size of the file, all the hash information you might need, the SSD hash that you can use to look up to associate families of malware. If there's a, a unique PDB path, we'll see an example of that here in a minute. Uh, entropy, whether or not it's high, high encryption or not, whether there's a file packer detected, the imp hash, if there's any certificates, right? This is data we tend to look at from the files once they're on disk. And so if we can dump those from memory, whether through, whether through a mem dump utility or, or through volatility extraction of the mem dump, or we use the minus X and log D or other method, even if it's just on disk, we can potentially do the static analysis, right? And in the end, you get potentially that bad.exe is likely suspicious or malware. So here's an example. Uh, here's Kovter, uh, clearly implanting twice into a syswow, so a 32-bit version of service host. And this is, this is Kovter, so this is a fileless malware that is actually regware. And then of course, also memware by the fact that they're doing implants and hooking. Hooking it by itself is not a great indicator of bad. It's just an indication that there's something going on. You'll see this heavily in browsers. In Quackbot, we can see the same behavior. Implants are occurring. Again, this time using Explorer with Quackbot, again, 32-bit. So the moral of the story here, if you're not watching for 32-bit executions of things in the Syswell 64 directory on Windows, um, you might want to start doing that. And then, of course, in Drydex's case, it is a side-loaded DLL. So you can see somewhere that this DLL exists and that there is injector on the parent indicator, run DLL32 is the thing they use to, in to inject it, and that we can look at that DLL and see that it's not from the Microsoft catalog on disk. It is not signed, so that's definitely an indication that we might wanna look at it cl closer. And then the B9 module says it's suspicious, and then the combination of everything, login D says, yeah, definitely it is malicious. Dumping and extracting files. If you use a tool to extract or dump files from memory to disk, you can statically evaluate them. This is what our B9 module is, or the plugins for volatility. You can look up the hashes in API like VirusTotal, but keep in mind when you dump things from memory, those are not the same files you see on disk, and VirusTotal or other hash repositories generally will know nothing about these because the extracted hash is not the same as the payload that was delivered to you because it comes from memory. It's, it's, it's definitely gonna be different for every machine and every dump. So you can send the file itself and then let the engines uh, regurgitate that sandbox, regurgitate it and go through it and see if it's malicious or not. Evaluate the makeup of the file to determine good, suspicious, or malicious indicators. You can extract the strings and then potentially even reverse them if needed. Um, and that's how you can look at these files. You can use a mem dump or volatility and or volatility to extract the DLLs and drivers, right? This is an example where you take and extract from memory the files, DLLs, and drivers uh, using volatility to then be able to act on those files that you've extracted from memory. Pretty typical thing for us forensicators to do. Uh, or you can use LogMD Premium to extract the files running live on a box. You don't have to do a memory dump. Uh, with the minus X, we will dump that information. If there's signs of injection, we will dump that those files to be further evaluated. Extracted files, LogMD and volatility, right? So same samples, uh, Quackbot, Coveturn, Drydex. This is uh, extracted using LogMD's B9 module. LogMD extracts it and B9 does the evaluation. And so again, uh, you know, Jimmy the James says these are bad. Uh, so clearly he knows something about the coyotes and, and mowers. Um, but in the case of Quackbot, you can see here that the PDB file is clearly an odd scenario, right? Um, again, unless uh, Park H. Hi Un CEO is in your organization, you might see that and go, hmm, that's kind of unique. Though the developer of a software may accidentally leave his real 
uh, his or her's real path in there. So this is their project database where they compiled the code. Uh, but in this case, it's a great indicator of that. In the case of Coveter, we can see that the original file name and internal file names are different than the actual file name. And this is pretty common in malware. So sometimes they'll take and cave a, a binary. So the internal information, the metadata that's inside that we look at with say a SIG check will definitely not match the actual file on disk. This is a great indicator to look for for malware. And then you got Drydex, who then uses this really great uh, PDB, C stop, soft, duck, liquid, build, wide. I can tell you by looking at the PDB, this is definitely a bad file. So these are typical indicators we look at when we're doing triage and string evaluations. And these are extracted with logmd and then valued at P9. So details of files. You can look for simple indicators. Is it signed? The metadata, the actual file name versus entire internal file name versus the original file name. Uh, sometimes in Microsoft's case, they come from a catalog, so you'll see you'll see some some additional things in the file name. But usually, the file names will match, right? Uh, even uh, application programs, the file names will match. The actual disk file name within the internal file names that were compiled will match. You can look for things like is a pack, great indicator of, of malicious scenarios. Hash lookups to an API like Virus Total or whatever. Uh, can you say, hey, has this hash been seen before? Uh, really, only valuable if you've pulled it off a disk. Uh, but then if it's from a memory dump, you can upload the file to VirusTotal once you've got everything contained to do further analysis and say, do you know anything about this? Or upload it to a sandbox and, and do that like any run or, or hybrid or any of the others, Joe Sandbox or Cuckoo, whatever. Um, and then you can determine the makeup of this based on this information of whether a file, a static analysis of the file is likely good, suspicious, or malicious based on the makeup of the file and these indicators. So download where, download where examples. They can call out to the internet to download the code, to compile it, or fetch the malware so it does not live on disk, right? Some examples of this are the Cobalt Strike and Scythe custom malware packages. Very common that there's an option for them to do this. Go put your code out on the internet, run this lull bin, go out to the internet, pull down the code, execute the code, it's in memory, great. Uh, persistence could be the lull bin calling out a text file to the internet, so you'd have to look for the lull bin. And generally, a lot of solutions will ignore the built-in Microsoft uh, programs. They just won't see this information. Or you'll have to custom create a list of low bins and low bass in your, in your log management to detect this behavior. And again, it's what's happening in the parameters that's important here. The compilers, csc.exe or msbuild, JSC, et cetera. So this is where they pull the text data down. Again, will be different for every malware. No AV is going to catch this. EDR is going to have a tough time with this because you're compiling the malware on the fly. So unless it then does something that EDR detects after the fact, uh, as many EDRs can be bypassed with this mechanism. And then, of course, they can write the disk on shutdown or delete on startup like we've seen in the past with uh, WinNTI or Drydex or others. So here's an example of a compile and fly. So here's csc.exe. And on the right, you can see the two files that generally get downloaded that contain the code that will then be compiled. So the, the takeaway here is you've got command.exe calling PowerShell. Please have an alert for that. You have PowerShell then calling CSC. So definitely have a call. Uh, or alert or a query looking for that condition or hunting for that condition. Command calling CSC, why? PowerShell calling CSC, why? There may be some known good conditions where that occurs. Great, filter those out. And then you can see what this looks like on the command line parameter, the no config, full paths, right? Those are the things you're looking for. And those text files, again, can be named anything, so it's gonna be hard to detect those. They will commonly occur and be randomly named in the temp directory, which is normally where they occur. So kind of noisy. Probably not a great uh, scenario, but the parent-child relationship, the combo here, definitely would get you the compile on the fly scenarios, a place to start for sure. So why running processes? Well, speed. Uh, speed because, you know, that's, that's what we're after here. If I got to do a thousand systems, speed is what we're after. And yes, that's Mrs. Jimmy James. And uh, it's far faster and more scalable option than, than scanning, you know, doing a system live for running process center module, modules than it is to dump memory. I don't know if you've gone and done 20, 30, 50 systems dumping memory and then determining the image info from volatility of which will allow me to process those and then go through and do all the processing of that. It's quite time consuming and all those memory images take a lot of space and you have to write it to, to write to a central area. Right, so there's some challenges with doing the, the typical old forensics way. So what we need is a new process to look at running processes on a live system. 
right? And so speed is your best friend. Speed and ease, definitely more scalable as well. Control panel applets. So this is a big pain for a lot of people, right? This is a, a popular red team and, and attack scenario. It is a miter attack. Control panel applets is a miter attack item. So this is a typical example of what they look like, right? Run DL32 will launch wherever the heck you want to put it, usually where other CPLs live, and they'll name it something looking like a typical CPL that you see to the right with Java. There's Java and Flash Player. Uh, in the control panel. So they'll name it something similar and will you really know that it's odd? Now it's gonna be unique hash, so it's not gonna trigger any AV signatures. This is a lull bin, run DL32. And so again, CPLs load all the time naturally. Every time you open up a control panel applet, every time Adobe updates or Java updates or any of the utility that has a control panel applet updates, you're gonna see these things load, right? And it's gonna launch that bad DLL into memory with a lull bin. So now we got a memory component and we have the execution of the low bin. Uh, the CPL file will load uh, all the time. So it's noisy, they're normal, uh, but it can also be, by the way, named anything. It doesn't have to be named CPL, but they name it CPL to hide amongst the noise of normal CPL. And third party applets are also not well signed. So now you're saying, ah, you, you mentioned signed items earlier. Yeah, not so much. So now suddenly the PDB, the internal file name, the actual file name become more important or better indicators of a combined uh, of bad, right? And many EDRs do not alert in this method. I worked at a company where we had a large EDR and this was a, a awful, awful uh, item that was not alerted to. And if you did build an alert, it was so noisy that it, it basically gave you alert fatigue. So again, the red team loves this because Cobalt Strike has it in there and it's so noisy and many EDRs don't do this, but it is a MITRE ATT&CK technique ID, so you need to address it. And it's probably one of the number one red team attack vectors. I know uh, in several places it's used heavily uh, in the red teams getting in and, and staying persistent for quite a while and saying, hey, I mean, you can't detect us, why not? Well, mainly because you're too reliant on EDR would be my number one reason and not enough logging. Uh, low bin, control.exe or run DL32 will be the launcher. It's hard to detect because of the normal noise. EDR is poor at this method in many cases. So how do you catch this highly used and successful uh, injection of, of code or, or loading of bad DLLs into memory? Well, one, logging executions of 46, 4688s, right? This is the running process in a Windows box. You're gonna look for CPL files and or control and or run DLL and you're going to go through the hassle of baselining what is normal. You're going to create a lookup list in Splunk, or hopefully your ADR will have an easier way that will allow you to slowly exclude these norms. Uh, or you can post-process those CPLs and see if they show signs of being malicious to further, uh, like we do in LogMD, to further say, hey, this is maybe a, a bad CPL file. Uh, because you can say if then then else right you can do this automation and actually go evaluate the files um, the paths usually will be the same they'll put them in the same c temp or c windows temp or c users temp wherever they're trying to emulate their their cpl their control plan outlet and they'll hide right amongst all the other noise right and so if you static analyze these cpl files uh, whatever the extension is where they're executed uh, might give you the, the dead giveaway that you need so catch me if you can of course, the lull bin, lull bass stuff I mentioned earlier that you know executes these things. Uh, take a look and definitely go look at uh, Oddvar Mo's project here. We just did a podcast, so go listen to the Incident Response podcast uh, a couple episodes ago where we had Oddvar and talked about this very vector and how hard they are. The list has grown tremendously, and I think almost every couple months we're seeing a new one that's uh, being added, either functionality being added to Windows when they do their massive OS upgrades or somebody finds finds a way to uh, execute a new lull bin. So this list is always growing. So you definitely should track the execution of these and have alerts and baseline the execution of these with the process command line and your other security tools uh, and or static analyze the ones that you're not sure about. So monitoring for and threat hunting. So here we go. This is of course, Jimmy the James monitoring all the goats. Monitor for and threat hunting. We need to develop a process to monitor, detect for and or threat hunt for the signs of these techniques. Step one, you have to enable the data. You have to enable the logging. You gotta go look at the cheat sheets. You gotta go turn this stuff on so it's collecting locally. Uh, this will help you in doing a ad hoc 
threat hunt. It'll help you with doing an ad hoc IR triage case. Let's say you want to manually execute LogMD, for example, or other tool. Or if you're collecting it to SIM, you got to have this data, this process command line running. You got to have the data sources collecting so that SIM can be of value to you. So if something does trigger an AV or ER, the data you need to actually investigate this will exist somewhere for some period of time. Step two, create detections for many of these techniques we've discussed thus far. Process command line will be key. It is in the parameters that you will catch this bad foo. Step three, come up with a process to scan running processes and their loaded modules. However you want to do it, I don't care. Of course, I'm gonna tell you LogMD works great for it uh, when we ship that version for you here in the near future. Uh, but detect these memory only infections. Uh, this is critical, right? Uh, TrickBot that I talked about infecting, infecting domain controllers. Uh, seriously ask yourself, do you have a solution that can go hunt for this or detect this? Do you have a triage solution? Do you have a way of checking for this without seriously borking the box and dumping everything and, and uh, putting the system on hold while you dump the memory and, and all that, right? So you need to detect these, these memory only infections and this should be both for regular detection and for threat hunting. So you should have the ability of doing both. If you have an automated tool that can look for it while it's running as an agent, great. But how would you hunt for this condition? Because they're gonna everly change, right? They're constantly changing. So I need a way to go check systems to eliminate that I don't have this condition if some weird indicator popped up in a box. Some new feature from Microsoft makes a bunch of stuff go off and you're like, hmm, is there something bad on that box or just Batch Tuesday? Uh, watch for indicators of injection, however uh, tool way you can do that because it's definitely something you're gonna need to, to do when you monitor and or go threat hunting for. Of course, static eval files for strings. You can eval files for known indicators of strings that may indicate injection. A LogMD Premium B9 module not only looks at the structure of the file to determine likely good, suspicious, or malware, but it also dumps the strings, which allow us to evaluate the existence of strings. We can post-process with a list of uh, a settings file that will have a bunch of strings in it that you can populate anything you want um, and look for these indications that a file might be malicious. Again, strings are potentially gonna give you a, a high false positive rate or normally naturally exist in things like drivers and, and bloatware from your, from your vendor. Uh, so be aware of that, right? And strings look like this, and basically a dump. There's a list of words. All right, you'll see that this program cannot be run in DOS mode if it's a binary. Again, we only look at the binaries that execute. Uh, you're gonna get the dump of the typical stuff the API calls on the left. And then of course you get all this interesting stuff on the right, right? So you can go through and say, all right, I've now dumped this because this is a typical step us triage people take and where we dump the strings and then we go look through the strings for signs of, of indications of bad. Like we see at the bottom left, we see you know, dinkumware. Like, what's that doing in here? Uh, because this came from a, a piece of malware, right? Not enough memory. We can kind of look at some of these calls going, this, this kind of looks kind of funky to me. And then of course, there is a list of strings that are known to exist when you're injecting. Uh, open process, virtual, like dot, 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 all the way down, create process, CW. But again, you will normally see these. These will naturally occur, right? And so uh, this is Jimmy, the James idea of strings, uh, you know, snare catching the bunny. So yeah. Different, different idea here, James. We uh, gotta look at the stuff on the left. Quit playing with the stuff on the right. So watch for downloading low bins and low bass. Malicious code has to be downloaded. If right, it has to come from somewhere. Word calling out to the internet, calling it down. Right, EDR does a pretty good job of seeing that word co command PowerShell scenario. But low bins is an entirely different duck. There's 120, 130, 140 of these things now. And so all these that can go out to the internet and pull down code need to be highly monitored. Right, these little bin and low bass are even more dangerous because they can download stuff. I remember from uh, uh, Wild West Hack and Fest up there in Deadwood, uh, Dave Kennedy was doing a keynote. I was sitting there in the LogMD booth, and he was talking about how Excel has the ability of calling HTTP down, and he uses Excel's HTTP download capability to then name a file that's naturally occurring if you Google it that then gets converted and injected with a low bin. Um, so great way to bypass some of these uh, tools, right? So you de definitely have to pay attention to these tools. Alert on these. Of course, baseline the normal, right? Because these are gonna be injected into memory at some point. Uh, there won't be many, uh, again, because generally these oddball calls out the internet are not naturally occurring. 
and watch for these executions closely. Here's a short list of them that can download. PowerShell, obviously, Bits Admin, right? The Bits Admin Transfer Service, so Bits Admin slash transfer. Uh, again, both of these are, are all, many of these are in the MITRE ATT&CK matrix. The short list by Cisco Talis based on an, an evaluation I did, I have a link here for you to look at their paper on it, is MSHTA is heavily used. We saw that a lot with Copter. Uh, Cert Util also, which is something we use as triage guys to get the hash out of things, right? Bits Admin transfers being uh, deprecated. Register 32, well known. PowerShell, obviously. Uh, and so these are short lists, but these are the things you should definitely focus on because these will be downloading, potentially compiling on the fly. On the left side, third from the bottom, you can see csc.exe, and on the bottom, you can see the example that uh, Dave had talked about at Wildless Hacking Fest. Um, but definitely watch for these very closely because either they're going to compile on the fly, inject into memory, inject directly into memory, side load, or, or whatnot. All right, process command line is key to mapping and then mapping that to MITRE ATT&CK. Make sure you map to MITRE ATT&CK to cover these gaps and slowly build your program better and better so you can see where your gaps are based on MITRE ATT&CK. I really like what, what they did with the sub techniques. It makes it much easier to understand the full gap of a, of a technique that we have that we need to address with a different tool or a different uh, process. Best options for process tools. Log management is clearly your best friend. If you have and can afford to put agents on all your endpoints and collect all the needed data, of course, log management, because then all the things I tell you to collect from a log perspective is gonna give you the initial execution of this occurring. Better yet, if you were to schedule log MD like I do in all my systems, and those CSVs also got pushed up there, I'd collect all the other cool stuff that I've talked about in this presentation, right? Similar to uh, an EDR, but I'm gonna see things that EDR doesn't wanna alert you on because it's so damn noisy. Uh, Sys internals tools will do it. Sysmon ID8 and 10 will show some odd indications using uh, WinRM and Arthur to go threat hunt, right? Built in Windows remote management. Arthur is just a PowerShell framework to go do that. You can memory dump the stuff and use volatility of all their possible options to look for these indicators as well. So there's many options that you can do to, to go do this. And Arthur will let you push out any binary or any tool that you care to use, uh, login data, system internals, uh, even volatilities uh, or memdom tools as well. All right, and of course, log management is going to be your best friend. It is my number one tool for security practitioners by far. So conclusion, Jimmy the James likes goats and the bunnies, of course. There's the goats and the bunnies together. And, you know, I think he needs a goatee, right? Thermal. Uh, and because there, there's this picture on the B-Size Oklahoma website. Eh, but he really does need a goatee. I think that looks a lot better. There, Jimmy the James. Because Jimmy the bad James. Bad. I sure hope he's listening. Conclusion. Create a process to look at running processes in their modules. I think this is becoming more and more critical, right? This is, this is a talk I gave kind of a couple of years back to say, you really need to be looking at your auto runs, right? These are static things that exist on all systems. They're just sitting there. You can easily look at them quickly. Well, guess what? The bad guys aren't using the auto runs in many cases, like I mentioned with TrickBot. So you're gonna need to have a way to go look at these running processes and their modules. And I say, and their modules because of Drydex, a lot of times they do load bad modules and they use a, a good binary or they'll inject into a binary and use a bad module, right? So there's lots of combinations they have available to them. Uh, look for signs of injection. These are, are critical, right? I, I clearly, I gave you uh, an example of that in the output from LogMD. Log the process command line execution so you can see that information as the execution occurs, the beginning of the attack. Hopefully you can detect potentially the uh, indication of this and then go execute your process to go check that box further. Uh, however, you might want to do that. Watch for the low bass uh, utilities being executed, the short list or better yet, the long list, maybe both have two alerts. Uh, and then of course, monitor for the executions discussed in this presentation for sure. And yes, there's some tools to consider, LogMD Premium, uh, once we release it, volatility and all their stuff. Uh, the Holofind uh, generally doesn't seem to be win com compatible, but who knows, maybe somebody will take that up and improve it. Uh, PE Civ is open source, get injected thread. I think that's kind of aged out. I'm not having a lot of luck with my testing on it lately and uh, with the PS Reflect stuff that uh, Matt and, and gang created there. Um, there's also Google GUR and the ability to doing that. Recall is no longer supported. Uh, it's been sucked up into another product. In, in Vitero, uh, MemHunter, old .NET 3.5. So I th again, a project that hasn't been supported. But again, I mention it because who knows, maybe somebody can breathe some life into these older products that at time did a, did a good job. 
And some more additional resources, you can look at the Red Canary presentation, Attack Deep Dive. I do not have a link. It was a, a webinar they ran. It was actually pretty good at giving you the idea of overall uh, what a process injection was. It's something I think all of us need to understand more of. And of course, please read the sub techniques which are now out. Uh, again, when I created this presentation a couple of weeks ago for, uh, or actually a month ago or so for Sans Deeper that I gave last week, uh, sub techniques have not been released, but as of two weeks ago, they officially got released. So go read up on those and go look at the MITRE attacks right on the main matrix page there. You can just collect sub techniques and please investigate those. Print it out on a big, print five copies, laminate them and then go hang them on a wall and start color coding to your defenses and, and threat hunts and, and your maturity. Uh, Deep Instinct can look for stuff like process injection and manipulation and of course end game uh, hunting and memory uh, slides. So some information and resources, homework, you have homework. And with that, the resources are there for you to go get some stuff. Arthur's free on GitHub. There is a freemium version of LogMD. It doesn't do all the fancy food we talk about here, of course, um, but it gets you started on getting your logging configured correctly so you can collect the right things. And with that, I will take questions in the Slack channel or live, however it is. Nathan wants to set this up, uh, but I think uh, whether it's uh, uh, through, I think it's through Slack offline. And so with that, uh, uh, we're done. And I uh, got time for some questions. Um, Michael, thank you so much. I actually took over for Nathan and then Chris and whoever oh. else, but I can confirm Jimmy did see all the stuff you were trying to show. <laughs> <laughs> I did, I kept showing him. I was like, come here, look at this, come here, look at this real quick. How many con people get a personalized presentation? <laughs> for those who don't know, Jimmy used to help me down here uh, with B Sides Austin before he uh, decided to defect north of the border. And apparently, Okies and Texans don't get along. I'm not from Texas, so I don't really care. I love y'all. Uh, nah. I love you, y'all, I guess. We, um, we love y'all, too. <laughs> but uh, apparently there's some rivalry, but I, I call him a defector. So this one, <laughs> yes. this one was customized James, just for him. James looked back over at me just now. He was like, <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's over running track, too. So if you want to hear more about James, wait until this track is over and go check him out on track, too. All right, guys. Uh, Michael, do you have anything else? I'm looking at the Slack channel. I don't see any questions right now. Do you guys have any questions for Michael? <laughs> uh, one of my one of my uh, people just pointed out to me. I'm still moving side to side. <laughs> I'm on my my pad's correct this time. My pad was all messed up during Sans talk, so I was I was doing this a lot because I'm trying to kick my pad back in place, which you know doesn't slide very well on the carpeting, yeah. so it was really hard I, to do. So I was I stepping up and down a lot. Uh, so Cheerio asks, does the LogMD Pro version do all that stuff? It does not. This will be a premium only version. Those who have LogMD Pro, so good question, will be grandfathered into premium. So good question there. Um, we will be taking care of you in that aspect. All right. Uh, Catharsis is typing right now. Um, we got just a few more minutes to fill in. Uh, we do have at 1150, everybody, we've got Melanie. Uh, Hendrix with SageNet is going to join us for an interview real quick. Uh, just so you know, SageNet, again, is the, the, the company that has basically brought us in here and, and helped us to run B-Sides this year. And so big ups to SageNet and everybody, all of our sponsors. We really appreciate all you guys. Um, Secure Ideas, True, Stinnet, um, Critical Start. I've got tons of um, so many different sponsors. Fortinet, I don't have them in front of me right now, but Thank you so, so very much. Looks like Sweeney's waiting with, uh, with uh, Melanie. So if you guys have any more questions, okay, let's, uh, let's get this one more in real quick. Looks like we've got about three minutes left. Uh, do you consider process migration as process injection? Uh, that's a good question. Um, probably because you're manipulating process. So let's just, let's just summarize anything you're doing to manipulate processes. Uh, to move one to another, to replace it, anything, I think is something we need to consider, especially if it's being used for bad. And, and this is obviously an area that they're capitalizing on in Windows because, uh, again, Windows is just broken. So there's so many things you can do to Windows. I mean, the fact that there's, what, 135, 142, whatever the number's up to of low bins, right? So application whitelisting is great, except when they use a low bin against you. Uh, so anything to do with process manipulation, any way, form, or manner is an area that's going to be used more and more by the trick bots, when NTIs, uh, Coveters, Drydex, et cetera, of the world, uh, the, you know, Scythe, uh, uh, clearly the red team tools uh, will definitely utilize these. 
So I'm going to say yes. Okay. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining uh, Mr. Goff's talk today. Um, again, we've got uh, Melanie Hendricks, who's going to join us here in just a moment with SageNet to talk about SageNet. For the interview, it's going to be with Sweeney. Um, as soon as uh, he's ready here in just a couple minutes, he's walking around here somewhere. I'm going to see if I can't get him to join. I see him. He's starting to come can you up. Hear me? I can hear can you. Can you hear us, Aaron? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you guys hear me? Awesome. Yeah, we're doing this remote. We're uh, we're getting fancy here. I feel like a uh, I feel like a news reporter here. We're roving. Yeah, we are we are roving. <laughs> Coming the... from Nathan. Yeah. <laughs> Live from SageNet in Tulsa, Oklahoma. This is <laughs> Melanie Hendricks and Nathan Sweeney. Awesome. So Melanie, tell me a little bit about SageNet, what you do. Very good. Um, well, oh, here at SageNet, I'm the VP of uh, Professional Staffing, so I get IT people jobs, like most of you, right? Um, and everything from security, uh, infrastructure, application development, all the way up to the C level. So that's what I do for other companies outside of SageNet for my clients. Okay. Yeah. What else does SageNet do? Like you guys have a wide range of of uh, offerings, right? Right. Absolutely. So our core is uh, started with um, the network and the network monitoring. And we'll go see that here in just a second. So that's Sage Connect. And then we have Sage View, which is our digital signage practice. So many different retail and uh, restaurant chains you might know of, which I won't go into detail right now. But yeah, a, a lot of those signs are, are things that we do. Nice. So it's a pretty cool practice. Um, we have Sage Wi-Fi, IoT services, and then Sage Secure, um, which is our security practice as well. Okay. So. Yeah, that makes sense. Managing all those networks, you get a lot of security yeah, concerns. Exactly. We've had a lot of like clients that. that started out in maybe the knock practice several years ago and have grown over the years and had di different needs. And yeah. when we changed our business to modify to that. So. That makes sense. Who, yeah. who, who is the average SageNet client? Like what kind of businesses do you work with? Uh, a lot of retail, um, a lot of uh, gas stations, um, a lot of large gas, oil and gas companies, um, banks. So a lot of diversity. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. I see some of your, I see pictures, I'm assuming customers on the walls, uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of chains that most people would know. Absolutely. Yeah. You, would, you would know lots of them for sure. Yeah. So, so your Knox is right down the yeah, hall, right? Yeah. Can we walk, can we walk down here and see? Roving reporter walk. All right. I see the, uh, the fancy little break room. Yes. Yes. What's the, uh, and, th and this is the digital signage. You mentioned that. Yeah. Take a peek in here, look through the windows a little bit. You can see the fancy digital signage. Pretty impressive stuff. Some uh, digital menu boards, right? Yes. Yeah. All so right. It's a little muted. For and then uh, the, the traditional cubicle environment. And now we're stepping into, this is where the magic happens, right? Yes. Sweeney, I got to tell you, you're a terrible cameraman. I'm a terrible <laughs> cameraman. Somebody forgot. Can you see this? For somebody him? forgot my <laughs> selfie stick. How about that? Uh, but, yeah, this is our, our, our core business where we started from, and this is our knock. And we, uh, we have uh, multiple redundant knocks uh, in, in the U.S. Okay. And we service over uh, just under a quarter of a million endpoints. Wow, quarter yeah. of a million. That's a lot of endpoints. Absolutely. All from right here. Well, from redundant. You said this they're all over the country. This is our home office, so this one is the largest one yet. Okay, so SageNet is based here in Oklahoma. Yes, this okay. is our, our corporate headquarters. Corporate headquarters. You hear that? We are broadcasting <laughs> live from the corporate headquarters of SageNet USA. Yes. Very good. Good to see y'all. Have fun. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Melanie. <laughs> you guys you. have been an awesome host, and this has been fantastic. Things are going really well, and I know everybody's really appreciating it. It's great so. to have you here today. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Melanie. We appreciate it.